Thank you for your <laughs> and welcome to this new edition <laughs> of the Gemini uh, North Talk. We are pleased to have you here with a lot of patience, Ray. Uh, Ray is the <laughs> most of you know Ray because he's the mastermind behind the uh, new upgrade of juniors with the two IFUs. But his career started back in Edinburgh, in uh, where he got his PhD in 1982, and then he moved to uh, to Durham, then moved to Australia, then he went back to Durham, where he's also working in instrumentation in, in addition to science, and he's also um, the PI of the KMOS instrument on the VLT. And now we are really happy to have him here, and he will make an overview of the past, the present, the future of high fields. Thank you very much. Is that? Um, right, so okay, I'm going to start with just, uh, I'm not sure exactly who's going to be in the audience, and uh, just start with a kind of few very basic things about integral field spectroscopy and integral field units. It's a hardware that we used to do integral field spectroscopy, so I'll talk a little bit about the advantages, some of the different techniques, uh, and then I'll talk quite a bit about the, the new IPs, the genius, why I'm um, here, and then at the end, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, multiple integral field spectroscopy and talk a bit about this KMOS instrument that took me about 10 years, I guess, of my life before it finally ended up on the telescope. Uh, and then a brief look at the future <clears throat> what might be happening on ELTs and uh, some other ideas. Okay, so first of all, what are the advantages? Um, well, basically, the idea is that the universe is not one dimensional, typical galaxy. Eventually, we will use a long slit in order to get spectra, but only in a linear fashion. Across that galaxy, we might produce a rotation curve, uh, like shown here, so it's a relatively slowly rotating elliptical, but it's got the classic uh, receding on one side and approaching on the other. And you probably just about see that there's something slightly weird going on in here in the middle, but it's really not very obvious what's, what the issue is. But with integral field spectroscopy, basically, for every point across a 2D field of view, we can obtain a spectrum, and then we can analyze that spectrum, for example, to derive the stellar velocity field in this case for an elliptical galaxy. And what you can see is that there's the global rotation pattern that you would expect, blue on one side approaching, red on the other side receding. But in here, there's also these well-defined two little blobs, which are actually going in an orthogonal uh, rotation. So this is what's called a kinematically decoupled core. And basically, without something like integral field spectroscopy, it's really hard to figure these kind of things out. So you need that basically two, a two-dimensional view uh, of a two-dimensional universe. So what kind of things can you derive uh, from an integral field unit or integral field spectroscopy? Well, you can integrate the signal up in each of these separate little elements, and therefore you can derive the, the morphology of the object that you're looking at, if you like, and in principle do some photometry. If you're looking at, uh, so that's what's happened here, this is just a, basically a reduced cube from our integral field spectrometer. It's basically generated a white light image, if you like, and you can uh, fit to that like you would uh, a normal image, you know, I suppose, and derive the electricity, for example. But uh, since we have spectra, we can also do a lot more, of course. Uh, so if you've got absorption lines, like shown in this little spectrum, or HB to N, N, HB to N, B, uh, you can study the positions and widths of those lines, so that allows you to derive, uh, as a minimum, uh, the stellar velocity field, so basically the rotation of the absorption lines, and the velocity dispersion field. And if you've got enough signal to noise, you can start to derive things like the asymmetries in those lines. So these are the indices H3 and H4, and they start to give you more information about the kinematics of these kind of objects. Basically, again, you can, across the whole two-dimensional view of that galaxy, you can calculate, for example, what the stellar velocity field looks like. Uh, this is the stellar velocity dispersion field, so peak it in the middle, cool it off regularly as you get to the edge of the galaxy. You can also analyze the strength of these lines. That would allow you to determine the, uh, the line strength of these particular lines, so learn something about the chemistry. Um, if, if the galaxy has emission lines as well, then of course you can study things like what's the distribution of the hot gas in the galaxy. This is a 
the three line intensity across this, this particular galaxy. And again, you can study the kinematics of the gas, try, try to understand whether the kinematics of the gas is the same as that of the stars. In generally, it's not. Uh, in some cases, you can, do, you can work out that the gas must have fallen in relatively recently because it's got completely different kinematic galaxies to the stellar, the stellar ones. So that, that's, that's the kind of science, just in a nutshell, that you can do with integral fields. So across many different areas, looking specifically what you can do uh, with a galaxy in this case. But then the, the question is really, what, what are the techniques that you can use in order to obtain those two-dimensional maps? Uh, and there's basically three of them. Uh, there's what we call lensless array, lensless only. Uh, and the idea, this is relatively simple. The idea is you put a little micro lens array at the telescope focus. Uh, that will uh, form little uh, images of the telescope pupil. Then you can feed those through a prism or a prism and disperse each of these pupils into a spectrum. Um, if you orientate the dispersion direction uh, correctly, you can get a reasonably good coverage uh, of the, each of these little spectra, except of course from a different point of view in the galaxy, so what we call the spax of spatial pattern. Um, and if you're clever about how you do this, you can get a reasonable sort of packing of these uh, short spectra. Generally, you're limited to relatively short spectral regions, so that's one of the disadvantages of this particular technique. Its advantage, basically, is its simplicity. Uh, the next idea came when people started using uh, optical fibers in astronomy, basically as light pipes just to relay the light from the focal plane. So it came in initially as a way of doing multi-object spectroscopy, but they had uh, high multiplex uh, studies of different targets across the field of view. And of course, you can pack those fibers very tightly uh, to some kind of fiber array. And the advantage of fibers is that, again, they're relatively easy to uh, change the the layout so you can go from a square field of view into a linear field of view. You've got a kind of pseudo slit and then just disperse again with some kind of conventional spectrogram. Then the, the third technique uh, is image slicing. That's the one we use with GNAS. Again, conceptually, it's relatively simple. You take the field of view that you want to look at, you slice it up with some mirrors, and then you re, re use more optics, basically, more mirrors, uh, in order to re orientate these slices into a linear slit, which you've got it into a one-dimensional slit. So of all these three methods, so the fiber scramble the information they pick up within the fiber. Uh, so of all these three methods, only the image slicer technique preserves the spatial information along the slice. It preserves spatial information within one of these uh, elements that you divide into three. Because there's no information across the slice, the dispersion directions are essentially lost out. A longer slice, you retain the, uh, the information. And that enables you to basically to pack information, every pixel in this spatial direction across the, in this case, it's going this way, dispersed, that's dispersed horizontally. So every pixel across these slices is giving you information about a separate point of view uh, within the, the galaxy. Whereas in both of these cases, each of these spectra, although it may span a few pixels, there's no spatial information uh, across it, whether it's a fiber or a, uh, one of these dispersed people images in the lens area. And so all of these techniques basically allow you to generate uh, a spectrum for each point in the field of view. And then you can reconstruct that into uh, a data cube. There's two spatial dimensions and one spectral dimension. And then, for example, this is uh, based the type of the GMOS IFU. If, if you work your way, slice by slice through that cube. Uh, you're looking at different wavelengths and therefore different pressures uh, as you scan through this uh, secret galaxy. So you go to the middle, looking at the middle of the cube, which is closer to the three, I think, uh, 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 gaseous emission line. So you start to see things to do with the jets in the secret, secret galaxy, which is a material that's excited uh, well out of so I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So the first of the lenslet only systems came in in the late 80s. So Tiger was an instrument on 3 HD. A few years, a decade later, I guess, with Oasis, which 
There's higher resolution, high spectrum resolution version of uh, Tiger. Uh, and then different kind of approach, really. So rather than going to higher spatial resolution, uh, SARAM was an instrument that was put on uh, the William Herschel Telescope in the Palmer. That was aimed at uh, basically going to bigger fields of view, to map uh, nearby galaxies through the kinematics, through the line ratios, and asymmetry. So this, this is the thing that was used to do the uh, survey of those nearby galaxies. Galaxies with very detailed kinematics, way, way beyond what we've been doing previously. Even So the, the second method is this uh, using fiber IFUs or lens look plus fibers. Uh, so the first, the first of these was uh, a system called Dems Pack at Kit Peak, uh, sort of one of the first. Um, again, late 80s, uh, and just basically reformat the, the dense pack of fibers in the focal plane, reformat it to a long slit, and then disperse the light. Now, one problem with doing that is that the fibers, of course, have a core. Which is the light carrying part, they have a cladding, and then they usually have a buffer on the outside of that. So there's a limit to how close to packed you can get these things on the sky. So if you just use bare fibers, then you don't necessarily get a good, very good fill factor in this 2D field of view. It's far sampling, you don't get a good, good fill factor. So yeah, this idea came along that you could use a micro lens essentially at the end of each fiber. So typically it will be actually be a 2D uh, micro lens array. A couple of fibers to the back of that micro lens array, and then these have really high throughputs, uh, so really high fill factors, maybe 98%. The other advantage is if you want to take one of these systems and retrofit it to an existing telescope, then you have a problem both, uh, basically at both ends the input to the fibers and the output of the fibers. Because the fibers like to transmit light in the most efficient way, the focal ratios of about f3 or so. So if you try to put it on Gemini f15, you really badly couple to the, the kind of optimum way to propagate through the fiber. But you can use this micro lens array not only to do, increase the fill factor, but you can also put it to change the focal ratio. So you can actually go through the fiber at a much better um, focal ratio, re reduce, reduce what they call focal ratio degradation. And then you put a micro lens array, a linear one, uh, the output and that converts you back to your F15 or whether you, you designed your your spectrograph. Uh, yeah. So again, this is this is kind of technology that's been put forward to, to try and make these systems very compact, so you can retrofit them to existing spectrographs. Because once you get to this slit, basically from then on, the rest of it is just a, a conventional spectrograph. You put it through some sort of dispersion elements. You get one spectrum out per. Uh, Fiber in this case, it puts back to, and then you can repack that into this data field that you can then do your science analysis. So the the, the tricky things really, I guess, I guess, are from a, a technical side. It's putting these things together so that they're still very efficient, but they're extremely compact. Uh, and the second thing is that this little step here, not so straightforward at all. Um, it's quite a lot of software effort has to go into a an integral field system in order to make these data cubes usable. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. But basically, raw integral field data, whichever of these techniques it comes from, is extremely difficult to work out what the hell's going on. So you manage to get back to rebuild the data. An example of a, 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 a lens uh, system, of course, is the one that's on GMOF. Two of these built in Durham in the early 2000s. Which is the most general north. Together, about 1500 fibers, still the view on the sky is about 7 by 5 by a second, so relatively small, but with a good spatial sampling of about 0.2 a second. Then, this whole thing is a relatively large shoe box that can fit into the existing system that was on Gemini. Or changing between uh, into the basically uh, an extra mode that's available. And uh, it's still going. It's quite popular and quite uh, robust so far. 
So image slices are sort of what I want to talk about. Uh, as I say again, conceptually very simple. Just find some mirrors, put those in the focal plane, and angle them appropriately. Each of them sends the image off to a different point. So in this case, they're all based sort of lined up. Uh, and then you can put those through a, a prism or a prism, and you can end up dispersing the light from each other. So as I say, you've got spatial information retained uh, along the slice, but in this direction, you're going to disperse it, so you have no spatial information um, across, across time. So what that means when you come back, when I'll talk a little bit about this in the next slide, but the spatial information along the slice is basically determined by the pixel scale along the slice, so pixel to pixel, that will tell you, assuming that, um, so that this, the, I should say, not the resolution, but the, the pixel sampling along the slice is basically just determined by how this will get onto your detector. Scale. But your spatial resolution on the object, because you've got no spatial resolution across the slice, your spatial resolution on the object is determined by the slice width. Now, when you get to project on the detector in your spectrograph, ideally you want the slice width to connect to two, to connect to two pixels or two or more pixels. So you've got a pocket uh, knife. Uh, if you're not careful, what you find is that. You set the spatial scale in this direction to be, say, 0.1 arc seconds per pixel. In the other direction, you've now got two pixels going across here, so the slice is now 0.2, pi 0.2 arc seconds wide. So you end up with this uh, asymmetric spatial sampling, which is 0.1 arc seconds in this direction and 0.2 arc seconds in the orthogonal direction from the target. So there's a way around that, um, that I'll mention on the next slide. So it quickly became apparent that uh, rather than just using flat slices, it was advantageous to use curved slices if you could manufacture them. So flat slices are nice, nice and easy to, to make if you're making a glass, for example. Uh, if you want curved slices, then you need to think a little bit about how you're going to manufacture those, because it's more tricky. Um, but it gave up this, this idea that Robert Compton came up with at the end of the 1990s called an advanced image slicer, and it basically uses curved um, three sets of curved mirrors, so the slicing mirrors are curved, you have power, you have a second set of pupil mirrors, also curved, you have power, and a final set of circuit mirrors. Basically, the light comes in from your target, hits the slicing mirrors, is re imaged onto these pupil pupils, the telescope is re imaged onto these pupil mirrors, onto the slice, and then they go to some slit mirrors. Again, basically, reformat the the light into a focal ratio that's suitable for the spectrogram. <clears throat> so you get this reconstructed image. Um, and then this idea of how do you get around this fact, this fact that you've got slightly different spatial sampling in two directions? Well, the answer is that before you hit these mirrors, you can stretch your image more in one direction than in the other. So you end up with a physical spatial scale, in, for example, twice, but twice in one direction. Is in, in the other direction. That's a sort of anamorphic design. Um, also, in general, if you want to manufacture these slices and have a reasonable spatial sampling on the sky, then if you're not careful, you end up with really tiny things that are very hard to manufacture. So, as well as this anamorphic magnification, we have a, usually two or three mirrors in what we call the core optics, and they magnify the sky basically onto the slicer array. So that just makes it physically bigger. And therefore, easier to manufacture using the machining techniques that we talked about in a second. So, what's the best technique? The answer is that there isn't one. Um, so, slicers, lens of fibers, lens of onies. You can calculate this thing called the specific information density, which is related to how well can you use the pixels on a detector. Because at some level, at the end of the day, the, the sophistication of your integral field system <coughs> will depend on. How many pixels you've got on the detector to play with. More pixels would allow you to do more slices or higher dispersion spectra or whatever. So, specific information diet density is higher than slices, goes down in some normal way to the lens of the rays because they don't pack information onto the detector as well, and there's no spatial information 
that's why the pupil images are brighter right only. But there's a very different question when it comes to complexity. It's exactly the opposite. The slices are probably the most difficult to manufacture. The fiber lens that things a little bit easier, although there's still some issues in making sure you've got good registration, etc. You don't stress the fibers and introduce perforation and degradation. Uh, down to a simple lens light array, which is basically just a, a lens light array in the front plane telescope, uh, and something else that will more optics that will disperse the information. There's a more uh, mathematical discussion of it than very so I've worked on a number of these uh, slicer IFUs as well as the fiber IFUs. So back in 2004, we produced the first of these advanced image slicer designs for Genos. Uh, those days it's on Gemini South, so 21 slices, 0.15 second sampling. And we use this anamorphic modification technique to make sure that the spatial sampling was the same uh, in the two more directions. Uh, we then built the the only a few that's on the nurse bed, on the WSD nurse bed, that was slightly bigger, 30 slices, but now something. Working with a thing called FSTL. Uh, now we're back uh, at uh, doing the two new IFUs for Gino. So uh, one of those is essentially a copy of the form of the original one. But we also now have a higher resolution design that basically is uh, trying to go for a better spatial sampling. Would be better suited to using that. So, another advantage of this advanced image slicer thing is it, it vastly reduces the size uh, of the slicer I use. Use that size pretty big. This thing is the size of a small shoe box. This is the original Gino IFU. This is the one that's on this deck. Low res version of the, uh, the new IFU. And then these are the filler slicer, obviously. And again, that's one of these is a folded flat. Seeing the design in a minute. So this is back for the, the new Gino's IFU. I'd say uh, identical for the low-res IFU, the high-res IFU, better space for sampling. But because at the end of the day, we fixed with this um, thousand by thousand uh, detect on Gino's, uh, essentially in terms of the spatial direction, so you go down a column, uh, the maximum we're limited to is about 900 spatial elements, so 25 slices. So the low-res one just replaces the uh, The new one is designed to exploit the healthcare AO system. Uh, as I'll show you in a minute, some interest, interesting ways that we can actually use the low-res IFU uh, in other areas as well. Um, they're achromatic, of course, so we can exploit both the blue and the red cameras. Uh, and we'll push out five microns. So the kind of unique, I mean, this, this, these are relatively small IFUs in context of what's available worldwide now. Um, I think I think it's very limited by the fact that we've got a relatively small detector, so one makes it from detector. Quite small these days compared to things like two RGs and H4 RGs. But the, the kind of unique selling points, I think, are that we have this capability, which it out into the, the near thermal infrared. Uh, and as I mentioned in a minute, this idea that using LGS plus P2, which most of you know what it is, basically using the laser guard style without, a, without a, uh, an on axis descent sensor, use the P2 wait, wait, mirror wave front sensor uh, in order to do the tip correction. And that gives you very high sky coverage. And then we looked at a few kind of example sizes. These are just a few examples. Do it. Um, so, so learners I a few design. Um, it's a bit hard to see. Three D model of it at some point. But basically, the light comes in. So, so one of the issues is if you want to do one of these retrofits, is that you've got to pick the light off. 
in a funk plane. Uh, and then you've got to put it through the LFD, and then you've got to take that and then you walk into the TV spectrum. So what that means is that the pick and the On top of each other, so you have to have a spatial offset between the pickup and the circular. So basically, it's just a problem mirror, a file file mirror. That falls onto these two mirrors, the first wheel is in there, the second wheel is in there, and magnify onto the slicer array. Uh, you can always say, actually, they all fall into the same thing. And then we go onto a triple mirror array. Finally, onto a slip mirror array, which deflects the light, so that's coming in from the bottom. We're now going back in two, and we're going to try and make the thing as compact as possible. And compact, back onto the slip mirror array, and work into Gino, back into the proper ratio that Gino is. Uh, so, the optical design is about the same, but in terms of designing these things, you're interested in what is a PSF like at the slicer? That's one area where you look for good image quality. So the people have got diagrams. These boxes are essentially one slice width. The raw geometric uh, performance of the, the system is very good. And then this is the uh, box, the box size of the slip. Again, one of these is one detector pixel. Essentially, all of the light is turning up within one detector pixel. So we'll get blurred by the signal beyond that. But you want to try and design. Design your system so that these PSFs are pretty good. And the way that we make these, and I've been making them right back since the, we made the first uh, Gino slicer, is with a single point down the machining method. Uh, that allows us, so we, we use a uh, machine from that company called Nanotech. Uh, it's five axis. Um, if you think of this as a uh, a lathe, a sort of machining lathe. You've got a, 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 something here that has got a fast rotating spindle on it. You bring that uh, as well as the rotation to move it in two sort of directions. You have something here that basically you can move back and two. You can also change the angle uh, of the spindle here. So these are the five axes. So with those five axes, uh, you can actually create all sorts of uh, weird forms if you want. So you can have to be spherical or elliptical or whatever. Um, surfaces, we do toroidal surfaces, we do off axis surfaces. And for most of them, you mount the tool here. So the tool is this little diamond machine, a diamond tip little tool. Uh, and the size of the tip, which is different sizes, but for doing these IFUs, because the components are actually extremely small, uh, use a 5 micron tip uh, tool. And for, for most of the optics, we will do them in a conventional milling sense. Like you put the tool here, you put the piece that you're trying to machine, so one of these four optics mirrors, uh, on this fast rotating spindle. But for the slicers, we do what we call raster fly cutting. So we actually put the tool on this fast rotating uh, uh, spindle, and then you kind of bring the slicer up using this system at different angles. You might have to make so you manufacture a jig to produce a slice at the right angle. Uh, and then you basically chip it all. Chip, it sounds awful, but it does work. It sounds like you're chipping away the metal. You scan across the optical surface. It's a substrate. Substrate, yeah, aluminum. Yeah. So one, one of the other things that we, we found really does make a difference in how uh, effective this is, even at infrared wave uh, is to use this. It's our 6061 aluminium. It's produced by the so-called rapid solidification process. Uh, so if you get conventional 6061, a lot of these little sort of defects of carbon and things. Uh, so they are a few micron scale, but they cause problems when you're doing this, particularly when you're doing this uh, faster fly cutting thing, because you can the, the diamond tool is sort of cutting through the aluminium, then it all of a sudden hits a slightly harder uh, piece of material, and it can sort of bounce. This is the so structure inside this rapidly solidified aluminium. I would say 6061. It's a much finer microstructure. But basically, that allows us to get much smoother surfaces. So, when you're down the machining, one of the things that you're fighting again is this surface roughness. Uh, 
right? Because you're not post polishing them. Basically, you machine them and then go code them to improve the reflectivity. Uh, but basically, the surface roughness isn't changed by the gold coating. So, depending, the bigger this number, basically, the bigger the scattering, general scattering loss is. It's just like light going onto a slightly rough surface. Some of it goes on in all directions. Where's the, where's the cutting in it? Does the oh, it's cutting? Cutting. oh, the cutting. We did cutting. You do it. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Well, when we did originally, we used the cutting in Germany. Uh, when we did the original genome slicing, since uh, I guess uh, yeah, certainly the the Nurspec slicer and the Tegu genome slicer were all done. So actually, we've got two of those now in two small machines. Quite a big um, machine set up now. Um, and uh, as I say, that, that you're driving to get this number down as, as small as possible. Once you get the scales, the scale of sigma over lambda. So of course, when you're working in the infrared, it's not so tricky. When you try to push down to shorter wavelengths, uh, the scattering loss is a bit bigger, and it goes one over lambda squared. You walk those sigma squared through the computer on the control. I'll show you some. Some of the uh, graphs that show the improvement that we've got here rapidly in the past. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that if you're going to put these things in a, uh, a cryostat, um, like Dina's, then you need to remove all the stress of the material. So I do a machine it, and it can just distort and do its own way. So after we go through two cryocycling, two cycles of cryo cooling, so basically you rough machine a blank. About the right shape but has no optical surfaces, and you cry a cool it, you basically you warm it at 50 degrees down to about minus 150, so about five cycles of that. And then you go in and you what we call rough machine it. You're actually machining it probably with to within about 10 microns of its final surface. And then we go and cryocycle that part again with one of these multiple cycles, and then you go on and do the final cut. So it just takes away the last few microns, makes them very accurate. Trial and error process to figure out how many times you have to cycle it. No, um, we stuck with what we did for. I think we possibly were given uh, a recipe when we from ESA when we were doing the nurse spec. Uh, you, we stuck with that. Yeah. Our feeling is probably it's overkill. Better to be overkill. <laughs> so of course. We have these you know, very clever machines that, you know, we have clever optical designers who can design all sorts of clever things um, with all sorts of complicated surfaces. But the question is, A, can you make them? And B, can you... You don't know you've made it until you can measure it. So metrology is a huge part of it. Um, so we typically use a combination of non-contact non chronometers, such as Dago. New view, you can use that. It basically sticks together across these parts. And we've measured about a millimeter square. We use that for measuring surface roughness and using this stitching technique you can use it to form. Uh, we also use a, a verifier, a large Zygo um, interferometer. Um, this, is, this is a setup that we developed for these new genos IFDs. We're basically, I think in this case, we're testing the pupil mirror arrays, which have spherical surfaces. <clears throat> but all, they all point in different directions. Uh, and so we have the part on a basically stage. We have a fixed ball here. <laughs> and so if you can imagine illuminating this system with a, a plane wave from a Zygo verifier, uh, it bounces off the mirror and it comes back. And providing you put this little spherical ball in exactly the right place, you have to use a CMN to make sure you put it in the right place, uh, it will send the light back and it will go back into the verifier and you get an idea of what the surface is forming. So you get the idea of the, the global. Global deviations from the ice. Basically, the measurement you can divide it up. Um, there's a theoretical surface that we normally take off because it's got some several waves of uh, curvit or non non spherical curvature. These mirrors might be tolerance, or whatever. And then we get we get left with a low spatial frequency form and a high spatial surface. And then these are just some examples of form error measurements on a mirror array. This is 
as one so this is the flat mirror the full mirror this is s2 so this is one facet the flighter. so you can still see these this is these horizontal things are just uh, uh, we've used this zygote to basically scan a crush as part well uh, it's left some Right, this is a circuit roughness measurement on one of the facets on the S3 mirror, which is the final mirror. And then this is showing the, the surface roughness. So these are the various three mirrors the, the slicer mirror, the pickle mirrors, and the, the slit mirrors. So these measurements here are all from the original Geno by a few 20 nanometers surface roughness. And then with this new RFA, uh, and some improvements in the so, uh, so there's a nine in Durham as well. So, here, so he looks after the, the diamond machining facility and there are two precision machinists who actually run the machines. So, I'm trying to find him. <coughs> uh, and then there's the IIT. So, Mark Double Dam is our mechanical engineer uh, who does the Integrated integration test. So again, it's got to get all these things in roughly the right place. Um, so that involves some of that alignment techniques. Yeah, the idea when we make these systems is that, for example, all of the pupil mirrors might be machined onto one substrate, and uh, <clears throat> the accuracy of these machines is kind of sub micron level. So relatively, they're all in the right place. But the question is, can you then put that array of uh, surfaces in the right place? So we actually diamond machine again. Um, specific making surfaces on the, the, the components that hold these mirrors. Uh, and so the idea is it should be plug and play, make all these things together, so kind of put it down. <laughs> it should be in the right place, and then if we need to shove a little bit, we can do that. So this whole, these, these are all the components that go into the lower environment, including the cover components. And this is my, my question. Both sides, but Trying to make sure that everything is aligned and that the point spread motion is okay. Well, that's pretty good. <clears throat> and so, th these are some of the first time scouring data from uh, the Lovers IQ that uh, Ben and Matt kind of provided. So, this is a uh, Lovers IQ image, 2.2 micron continuum of this radio galaxy with the equivalent thing from HST, the wavelength figure. It's almost as well as actually speaking ground in terms of spatial resolution. Uh, but the big difference is that this is just an image, a broadband image. Uh, for this, we have spectra, and every one of these stuff is across the, the field of view, so we can also look at the emission light coming out from the, the radio galaxy. And then the second thing on the right is the uh, gravitational lens. Uh, sources are actually gravitational images of background quasar, and the lens by this broadband galaxy. Three. Uh, and this, this is actually taken from a night uh, for that second scene, uh, just uh, with the uh, IQ. And this is the same target from the previous night, actually, uh, taken in this LDS plus three work as well, using Altair in front of the Lerez IFU <coughs> with the uh, P1 reaction. Uh, that's about 40 cents. Very promising. That would be a uh, really powerful technique in the future. Uh, Harry's IFU, I'll skip through it. Very quickly. Uh, similar sort of design again, basically input, full mirror, two four optics mirrors, slicer, pupil. Let me know some sort of in, in the design. Um, the big difference here, obviously, is the field of view is much smaller because we've pushed up to three in both directions in terms of spectral resolution. And the impact of that basically is here. Uh, so we need to have the optical circuits, etc. Uh, characterized to better than uh, 50% contemporary images for full mathematics, but better than full mathematics. Uh, 
Um, but the big difference was, uh, yeah, we manufactured the genus, low res IFU, the slicer was manufactured in two halves, do with the way that they were the slices were coated relative to each other, in order to get in the machine. Uh, just like in the low spec IFU, we now tilt from one end of the slicer. That means you can manufacture all 25 slices basically without hiking them. Uh, in this case, we we'll split the people in the other end. But again, basically, at the slicer, and at the slit, I managed to maintain the fraction of the typical degree where you want to be, can't be better than that, just the design, not the actual slicer. And then uh, the metrology setup, if I can remember what I was doing, I can go back to the DVI, if you want to the PSFs at different positions, five positions across an individual slice. Do all the slices, measure the PFS size. Because of the anamorphic verification, not even PFS, but they appear to be elongated. That's only because the spatial scale in this direction is just proportion to PFS. So these are these are all the forward uh, path matches measured in the spatial direction. So this is measured that way. Scale, scale. You see, basically everything is coming in below the 40 milliamp second spec that you wanted, um, even more so in the other direction. So the status uh, pre ship tests were done in September, shipped in October, managed to get some lab data uh, towards the end of last year, and then the we get on sky because we had a mirror issue. We're now doing some, we were doing until yesterday, a lot of prep tests, uh, and we're still hoping to get the first sky data in July. Uh, we'll be able to get this there and discuss offline. So, quickly moving on, just a little bit about multi object integral field spectroscopy. Um, so, you can do it with fibers, of course, so there's ways of doing it. The screen goes at this, flames on the VLT. 15 of these little IFUs that basically could position any, anywhere within a large field of view, 25 on the Coming on the AAT, similar in the IFUs, but a bigger uh, control field, uh, not quite as good as the sampling. And then Manga, it's been a very successful thing on Sloan, really wide control field, uh, relatively low sampling. There's also Muse, uh, I mentioned Muse because Muse is a sort of multi object uh, IFU. It just happens that all the IFUs are fixed next to each other. Uh, so, Muse is an interesting thing, and we can use in the future. Uh, it's a really wide field of view, so quite a few of you know about it. The total field of view is a, an art minute, but it's split into 24 subfields with a thing called a feed split field splitter. Splits it in a weird way, 60 seconds long, but Wide, and then each of those feeds another IFU, conventional looking thing, uh, that samples uh, each of those segments, each of those segments, you know, point to that second sample. So effectively, you get an IFU that points to that second sample over one out minute square field of view. There's a lot of detector area to do that, 24 4 k square CDs. This is in the optical, of course. Uh, you have to detect a real estate for cheaper, 90,000 spectra. So again, don't have the software, you can print it instead. Uh, and it, it works over this 10.5k. Really innovative thing about Muse was this idea that you could do it in the optical anyway, you could get away with glass slices. So this company, Winlight, I think, are the only people that really do this now. So you can do powered glass slices, uh, and it's a huge had a huge impact. So Muse is optimized to work in the red, uh, and there's now a kind of clone of Muse design study. Underway, so we're talking a little bit. We won't be talking original news. So the idea is to do a complementary set of wavelengths to get out 350 and 580. So we've got a similar effect in terms of field of view and so forth. KMOS, uh, so as I say, KMOS took me about 10 years really from starting it to finally on the sky and starting to do the observations with it. 
So this is the Chaos Christ app, so we can cross. This is a multi object infrared integral field unit. The first one, well, the only one, everybody's tried. And then this was a, is a big sort of co rotator thing that carries all the electronics, co rotates with the laser, the rotator at the back. So these are very rough uh, specs, so 3.25 percent operate on it, five microns, special resolution. About 3,000, so you can be worked in the front of the line. So the 24 separate IFUs, just on the third second, like second sampling. And the patrol field is about seven or eight diameter. And then so that's how close you can put two objects together. The key really is this thing. This is the, the pickup arm from Kamos. So this is something that basically positions a little pickup mirror. The seven on it in the view, the lights relayed out so that the trombone system here there is taxi. Obviously, when you're, when you're near the edge of the field of view, go straight down, it's a bit harder to get the work. So the trombone will lose half its speed back. Uh, and you've got to get this whole thing to work at, uh, at 60 degrees Kelvin. I work reliably, so I've got to work ready for this. I pack 24 of these into the field of view, what it looks like, and then it's face on. So these are 24 pickup arms. This is a seven part minute field of view. Here and then behind it is a calibration unit. Right. DV field of view. The IFU system uh, broke, broke it into some three modules, each of which have eight, eight IFUs. Individually, the, the IFUs are you know, similar in overall design, I guess, to the Gino's one. Again, in this case, it's 14 by 14, and it's 14 space elements uh, at 0.2 arc second sampling. The longer slice, which is a 2.8 arc second field of view, this slice is 0.2 arc seconds wide, and so it's 2.8 arc second. So the idea is to study relatively small objects, that's just you know, seconds or so. To be able to multiply it's up to about 24 of these. These are the optical surfaces that go into one set of eight of these. Uh, three of these, each one of the each set of eight IFUs essentially contains one spectrograph. Uh, kind of have three cryogenic spectrographs uh, within these different. There are 1,080 optical surfaces just in the eye. Uh, I just want to briefly mention a bit of science. Um, so, yeah, as I say, the big, the big thing was being able to go from just studying, for example, the kinematics of high redshift galaxies one by one, slow process. So, so we did these kind of surveys, some of the ones at West Bank. There were maybe a few tens of objects that had these kinematic things, and so we came off the kinematic time essentially. We were able to build up samples of a few hundred and stuff to really characterize what is the average population at the of one, which so far we got. This is the first survey that we did uh, cross. Um, and then we followed that up with a, so that was working in the J band essentially, looking at HL for redshifted J band, so you can see each one of these galaxies. The star formation rate is the same as each one of them has a kinematic. And then we pushed out through the H band the higher redshift, which is that which is two in the end. Uh, and then what we're able to do, because of these large samples, was basically so a real problem when you're trying to do these study of things at different redshifts to try and work out how the universe is evolving, is to make sure that you're selecting galaxies in a consistent way at different redshifts. So because we had these really large samples. We could actually do that pretty effectively. So what we managed to do was combine the SAMI uh, redshift survey, that's actually redshift zero, and come up with a set of consistent galaxy selection techniques. So the star formation rate, <coughs> it was the same for SAMI, the same across at redshift one, same at the previous so came off galaxy redshift survey, but redshift uh, <coughs> And then this, this is just showing a plane of uh, Anglo-Mountain versus Stellar Mass. 
So they're basically very little is evolving out to a human that's just a 1.5. So the universe is uh, only about 3 giga years old at this point. But you've got about 10 giga years. And what we're seeing is basically there's still a lot of very normal Milky Way type galaxies, even out at these edges. Originally, it was thought that a lot of these kind of quiescent galaxies would only form at relatively low redshifts. But it turns out that you get these pretty well formed disky galaxies out of these redshifts. And indeed, there's, there's kind of more recent stuff than JWST pushing out to higher redshifts at surface, even at the redshifts of four or something. Pretty well established disk galaxies. But not quite the same as the Milky Way, they have more um, turbulent support and a typical disk galaxy locally. Basically, the only difference the sort of, this is essentially that, uh, the spin, the way that they acquire their spin. So, I just wanted to move on uh, briefly. So, we've gone on to do uh, a survey called Curves, and uh, Ultra B. Rotational velocity survey. Um, so, yeah, again, we can pre select galaxies from what we've done with Kermos already. And cross our pages. 32 staff where we mentioned interest galaxies that we can just apply. And the idea was to get extremely deep rotation curves out to several effective radii, trying to study what was happening uh, in the outer part of these galaxies. And to do that, you need extrinsic status attraction. So, I think this is something that we, is, is always worth bearing in mind with any infrared instrument, which is particularly important, <clears throat> with these IFU instruments if you want to push to really high levels. So this is one issue, any kind of flexure will completely kill you in terms of the, uh, its line subtraction. <clears throat> so this is just showing that you get you know, very effective concentration. There's also now these more sophisticated sky subtraction algorithms. So this is Zap. But it's uh, Zurich Atmospheric Approach. Uh, so it's developed thing we use, actually. Uh, what's shown here is a uh, bit of the spectrum in the red part that the use can observe. And then the green is sort of what you get with a pretty well tuned sky subtraction algorithm. Um, still has several of these individuals where they're moderately strong. These are not the strongest ones. And then this red thing is what you get from the Z. And this is one of these PCA techniques, or principles. Component analysis. So the idea is that basically you do a crude sky subtraction, and then you look at the residuals in all your spectra, try and work out if there's some sort of systematic pattern that is still there due to sky subtraction. <clears throat> and the tricky thing is to, to make sure that the systematic patterns that you pick up, that you then subtract out, uh, are actually sky and are not the objects. This is just showing that you can quench the skyline residuals without, in this case, affecting the catching system. Uh, and so we, we did some early experiments uh, looking at just taking the KJS data and bin it. So the KJS data, those early crossing KJS data, were basically one night exposures, so they're in town. So we binned it into these, uh, this number of OBs, so you can see number one hour exposures, if you like. <laughs> What we were able to show that was that using the techniques that we had, and we kind of used this that algorithm for chaos as well. But you get a pretty nice relation. But you're still basically in the pattern noise limit limit as you go out to more and more and deep. So we worked out that if you wanted to get out here to about half of a this scale, six and a half this scale radii, you um, needed something like 100 hours, 100 OBs on the VLT. That is what we eventually got. So just integrating away uh, is, is one of the science things is sort of trying to compare the you know, dark matter fractions versus mass, uh, comparing observations basically with these blue dots, which are uh, the Eden simulation. Too much time for that. Implementation issues for ERTs. Um, why do we need them? This is, these are science texts, but it's a mosaic. The ELT and the purple ones the IFUs. We're not going to need them. Some of the issues, well, potentially, uh, ELTs, of course, are big. They're just as small as 
perhaps within it. But you know, one attraction of the of views is that a kind of principal exploit for d squared advantage, which means that you need to be down at the diffraction limit in your sampling in order to take to, to the best advantage of a large telescope, which is a bit of a black collection bucket. More uh, <coughs> uh, limit. Uh, as well. Lots of information does take up slices. Screen. Uh, language. Uh, pretty versatile. It's easier to use slices. Came off to see that. Uh, so this is the ELT solution. So cutting our meter diameter. <laughs> Basically, three, three instruments, harmony, mosaic, and method involvement in the uh, So, one thing that uh, I know quite a few of you will be aware of the kind of surprise and horror that people found when they started building instruments for eight meter class telescopes, uh, having really four meter class telescopes. How much more difficult it was to build an instrument you know, on spec and on time, etc. Eight meter telescopes. Of course, it'll be. Come again in space when we go up to these uh, extremely large telescopes. So we've now invented a new weight unit. So we now measure these instruments of how many elephants. How many of six elephant instruments? I think it's four, if I remember, three elephants. But also, you can see the size of them. These are eight meters high. Uh, so just exactly where you put these instruments together is starting. Point. So this just shows again the solution really is that. There is no preferred solution. So the Harmony infrared uh, single target IFU, basically three spatial scales, 60 mile arc seconds, right down to the DLT spectrum limit in the infrared. Four mile arc seconds. Different spectral resolutions to make them as flexible as possible. It's going to use slices. Uh, mosaic is going to use fibers. So primarily, it's a multi object fiber instrument, but it has a deployable multi IFU. Capabilities of so Fourier capability is uh, uh, appropriately state. The clover I have used with about 200 million arc seconds. And the Metis is the infrared instrument on ELT, very high spectral resolution. It will have Sure, that's right. Anyway, there's a slicer in <coughs> a field slicer. <coughs> and yeah, substitute, substitute slicer. And then, of course, super reality, US, virus on TNT, PSPS, or synchronous substitution. So, where do we go from there? Far future. <coughs> well, I see it. Um, Kieran O'Brien uh, in Durham, Ben Amazing. Barbara, uh, we're all working hard on these uh, micro kinetic induction detectors. Potentially something that would super supersede things like <coughs> ECDs or like solar arrays. Sensitivity right from UV to the infrared. Each pixel has energy sensitivity, so it's got intrinsic sensitivity energy, and also arrival time, so they're essentially photon counting. With the photon counting, they have no read noise. Those uh, are the advantages. Disadvantages, you've got to get them very cool, so you've got to get them down to really cool um, temperatures. Try out the detector here, it's in this huge dimension fridge, and it's really down to really cool. Um, <coughs> at the moment, the spectral resolutions, the energy resolution that they can get is somewhere between about 5 and 100, uh, where they're dependent, that's in the UV. Um, but that does depend on exactly what superconducting material you use. And then they can, relative to TESs and things like that, can do a bit of a tunnel and peak a little. Quantum detector, you can put these into pretty, pretty large arrays. Um, 100,000 pixels is currently proposed, so you know, megapixel, so you've got that far off. I've got a little movie here that needs the, the sound put on. How do I do that again?
I was playing the audio, but it's not coming out for some reason. So I stopped sharing the audio because that doesn't seem to work. <laughs> I think as you share the audio, it's not working. I don't stop sharing that audio, Brian. It don't work. <laughs> Yeah. And your sound is on? Yeah. There we go. It's just a little video of it, Mark, and my students. And these are the galaxies I've learned completely across. Images. These are the rusty fields. Like that. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's <laughs> Rotating with the speeds that we got from the phone. <laughs> so if you're sharp, you'll observe, you'll observe that there's not a lot of solid body rotation around. That's just the same thing.
Time, Time for questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we should be good now. Time for one question. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. What, what is the limitation to have a muse like in the infrared? Is only the price of the detector? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, you saw how complicated that yes. picture of cryogenics was on, on muse already. Uh, Technically, the new array, the M key. ID will do that, but they're really poor solutions. It's a better solution. Yeah, and at the moment, so at the moment we're looking at the idea of using them for as effectively as in lieu of cross dispersers. So you take a high order, multi order spectrum that's just on one line of pixels, and then you use the resolution of the MK to work out when a photon arrives, which order is it wrong, which way. But in the future, could be up to spectral resolutions of a thousand, probably not. It's ten times. Yeah. I guess the other it'd be detectors that have the cryogenics and infrared moves. Right at the moment, it's like split it into lots of small class. <clears throat> so you could do that entirely. Keep everything cold in the infrared. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Thank you.